Review of Thomistic Anthropology. In this part of the review of Thomistic Anthropology, we'll go over the sense appetites, which are also called sensuality, the passions, which are the inclinations resulting from the sense appetites, and the locomotive power. In the last video, we saw that there are five general categories of powers of the soul. The first is the vegetative powers, the second is the sense powers, the third is the locomotive powers, the fourth appetitive powers, and the fifth intellect. Now the appetitive powers are divided into two kinds. There are appetites which follow on the apprehension of the sense powers, and there is the appetite which follows on the apprehension of the intellect. The latter is called the will, or the rational appetite. In this video we'll look at the sense appetites and the locomotive power. In the last video we had already addressed the vegetative powers and the sense powers. In a future video, we'll have to look at the intellect and the will. Let's first look at what an appetitive power is. Now, the word appetitive might look unfamiliar, but it's somewhat similar to the word appetite. This is a good starting point, but it's important not to stop at the common notion of appetite. Now, commonly, when we say someone has an appetite, we mean that they have an inclination towards food. They want food. Now, appetitive powers are, in general, those powers which give us an inclination towards something, precisely as apprehended. Now, some of our inclinations are not based on apprehension. For instance, if we took a step off of a building, we would incline towards the center of gravity, possibly resulting in our maiming or death. Now, that inclination is not based on apprehension. We don't have to observe anything about the center of gravity, which is desirable, in virtue of which we fall towards that center of gravity. We simply incline towards it, regardless of whether or not we have any apprehension of that center. On the other hand, appetitive powers are precisely those powers which give us an inclination towards what we apprehend. So if something isn't first apprehended, it cannot be desired by an appetitive power. For instance, a rock has an inclination towards the center of gravity, but it obviously has no apprehension of the center of gravity. Rocks simply incline in virtue of their nature, not in virtue of some apprehended likeness of the thing towards which they incline. In contrast, a hungry man has an inclination towards food, not directly, but rather in virtue of the fact that he's thinking about food. So what mediates between the power and that towards which it's inclined is the likeness or apprehension of the thing towards which the power is inclined. So again, appetitive powers move us towards external objects by first being moved towards a likeness of those external objects in the apprehensive powers. Now you'll recall that sense is an apprehensive power. Sense is what gives us a likeness of the things around us in the sensible world. For instance, when we sense a tree, we form a likeness of the tree within our soul. So this likeness becomes the principle of the appetitive powers inclining us towards that external object, such as a tree. 
Now, there are two ways in which we can apprehend something, either through sense, as we just described, or through the intellect. Therefore, there are generally two kinds of appetitive powers. There are sense appetites, which can also be called sensuality, and there is the intellectual appetite, which can also be called the will, or rational appetite. Now, the first of these, sensuality, takes for its principle the apprehension that is found in the sense powers, such as the external senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, etc. In contrast, the intellect takes or the intellectual appetite takes for its principle the apprehension that's found in the intellect. That is, the concept or understanding of a thing. Now, we'll address the intellectual appetite, or will, in a later video, but for now, we're going to address the sense appetites, or sensuality. Now, there are actually two appetites. The first is called the concupiscible appetite, and the second is called the irascible appetite. These are strange words, but you'll want to memorize both how to spell them and how to pronounce them, because they're crucial for analyzing the moral life. To begin with, you can associate the concupiscible appetite with that power which underlies our desire for food and sex. The concupiscible appetite is more than that, but this is a helpful association to begin with. Likewise, you can associate the irascible appetite with the power underlying anger or irritability, that is, the desire for revenge. Hence, this is called the irascible appetite, that is, because it's associated with irritability. Now again, the irascible appetite is more than that. It's more than a power underlying anger and irritability. Nevertheless, that's a helpful association to begin with. More properly, we could define the concupiscible appetite as that power which aims at what the senses apprehend as good without qualification and which inclines away from what the senses apprehend as evil or bad without qualification. So, insofar as our senses, especially the inner sense of the estimative power, determines that something is good, then we incline to that through our concupiscible appetite. It's only when we add on a certain qualification, namely difficulty, that we get the irascible appetite in play. The irascible appetite aims at what the estimative power apprehends as an arduous or difficult to achieve good. Likewise, it inclines away from what is apprehended as being difficult to avoid, but evil. So, we can associate the concupiscible, concupiscible appetite with the sensible good or evil, simply speaking, or without qualification, but we can associate the irascible appetite with the arduous good and the arduously avoided evil. So, again, insofar as something is apprehended as good, we incline towards it with our concupiscible appetite. But insofar as it's apprehended as good and difficult to achieve, or evil and arduously avoided, then it's related to our irascible appetite, not our concupiscible appetite, under that aspect. Let's look at an example of the sense appetites in action. First, a bull's estimative power apprehends that a cow is good. Second, the bull's concupiscible appetite inclines towards sexual relations with that cow. Third, the bull's external senses and estimative power apprehend a danger in between himself and the cow, namely an enemy bull. This would be a competitor for his mate. Fourth, the bull's concupiscible appetite inclines the bull to run away from the enemy bull, and therefore to run away from the cow as well. In other words, the concupiscible appetite inclines the bull that wants to mate with the cow to run away from the very good with which it wants to be united, but in virtue of the enemy bull standing in between the first bull and the cow with which the first bull wants to mate. Fifth, the bull's estimative power apprehends the killing or maiming of the enemy bull as an arduous good insofar as it would permit access to the cow, 
which is apprehended as good without qualification. Six, the bull's irascible appetite inclines the bull to do battle with the enemy bull. So now there are two options, and we don't know exactly what the bull is going to do. Is it going to run away, or is it going to do battle with the other bull? If the bull's concupiscible appetite away from the danger is stronger than his irascible appetite to kill the enemy bull, then the bull will run away, not fight. On the other hand, if the bull's irascible appetite to kill the enemy bull is stronger, then the bull will fight and not run away. We can't tell beforehand what the bull is going to do because we don't have direct access to the degree of intensity of these various appetites. Now, from this example, there are a few conclusions that we can draw about the sense appetites. First of all, every movement of the irascible appetite is preceded by and followed by a movement of the concupiscible appetite. As we saw, the irascible appetite was inflamed in order to defend and bring about the achievement of what the concupiscible appetite desired. So, for example, we first have a desire, which corresponds to the concupiscible appetite, and that provokes anger at what is an obstacle to the desired good, and this corresponds to the irascible appetite. And finally, we have pleasure once the desired good is obtained, if it is obtained. And this final uh, emotion corresponds to the concupiscible appetite. Thus, we can say that the irascible appetite is like the servant and protector of the concupiscible appetite since it helps the concupiscible appetite to get what it wants. The concupiscible appetite is what determines the ultimate good and the starting point, but the irascible appetite is what achieves that good by overcoming obstacles. Now, as we've said before, the irascible and concupiscible concupiscible appetites are powers of the soul. The movement or operation of these powers is called, in a technical sense, passion. As seeing is the operation or motion of the power of sight, so too the passions are what we call the operation or motion of the sense appetitive powers. Passion, in the sense in which Aquinas uses this word, is roughly synonymous with emotion or feeling, but the word passion should not be confused with the restricted sense in which we often use this word in English. Note that it is not merely intense inclinations that are called passions, but weak ones can be called passions as well. Any inclination whatsoever, whether intense or weak, that results from the appetitive powers is called a passion. So for instance, being madly in love or mad with anger is an intense passion, but someone who is moderately hungry is inclined by a passion as well. Likewise, someone who, without thinking, sips a drink, cracks his knuckles, or scratches her head is also moved by a passion, even if it is barely noticeable. So the passions are any inclination whatsoever that results from the concupiscible or irascible appetites. These need not be the intense passions, which we more normally call passions. St. Thomas Aquinas distinguishes between 11 different passions. Knowing these 11 passions helps not only with analyzing questions in the moral life, but it also helps us have a better understanding of what he meant by irascible and concupiscible appetites, since these passions are precisely the inclinations which result from those powers. Now, some passions correspond to the concupiscible appetite. Others correspond to the irascible appetite. The concupiscible appetite, as we said, is directed at good or evil without qualification, whereas the irascible appetite is inclined towards the arduous good and away from the arduously avoided evil. Now, the inclination towards good without qualification can either be a simple inclination or an inclination with respect to good or evil as currently absent, 
or an inclination with respect to good and evil as present. So the distinguishing feature here is, do we ignore temporal qualifications like present and not present, in which case we have a simple inclination, or do we consider the good and evil as currently absent but possibly present in the future, or do we consider the inclination towards a good or evil insofar as it is currently present? If we go with the first option, then we distinguish between love and hate. Love is a simple inclination towards the good without qualification, and hate is a simple inclination away from evil without qualification. Now, if we look at the inclination towards good and evil without qualification, insofar as that good and evil are currently absent, but potentially present in the future, then we have desire and aversion. Desire corresponds to the good, which is possibly present in the future, and aversion corresponds to the evil, which is possibly present in the future. Finally, if we look at the inclination to good and evil without qualification, and we consider that good and evil as currently present, not as future, but as currently present, then we have joy and sadness. Joy corresponds to the good, which is currently present, and sadness corresponds to the evil, which is currently present. Joy is also sometimes called pleasure, delight, or enjoyment. Sadness is also called pain, sorrow, or misery. Now, let's move over to the irascible passions. Uh, we can consider the arduous good uh, insofar as it is the object of an inclination uh, towards something that is currently absent, or insofar as it is the object of an inclination towards something that is currently present. Notice that this is similar to the division we saw within the concupiscible passions. The only thing missing is the simple inclination, but there's no such thing as a simple inclination towards the arduous good. We only have simple inclinations towards things which are good without qualification. We don't have simple inclinations towards things which are difficult goods. And so we only divide the inclinations of the irascible passions uh, by whether the object is currently present or currently absent. Now, if the object is uh, currently present, then we have anger. Anger is a movement of the irascible appetite uh, to remove a present evil. This, um, put more loosely, is a desire for revenge. If you think about what revenge is, uh, revenge is fundamentally an attempt to remove some evil that's already been done. Uh, if you expand that notion slightly, you have anger, which is the desire to remove an evil that is currently present. So, for instance, if a dog is being threatened by another animal, such as a snake that's entered into the house, that is an evil to the dog's estimative power, and so the dog is angry at the snake and wants to remove that evil. It wants to remove the, the evil of having an intruder within its domain. And so anger can be said generally to be the irascible appetite to, mo to remove a present evil. Now, if we look at the inclinations of the irascible appetite, uh, which are towards the good or evil that is currently absent, then we either have an inclination towards the good or we have an inclination towards the evil. Let's take the first option. Now, if it's an inclination towards the good, then we either have the passion of hope or the passion of despair. Hope is a movement towards the ardu arduous good because it is good. So you're not moving towards the arduous good because it was arduous, but because it is good. That's hope. On the other hand, despair is a movement away from the arduous good, not because it's good, because it is, but rather because it's arduous. So if your focus is on the fact that the difficult good is actually good, then you have hope in achieving that good. But if your passions are focused on the fact that it's difficult or impossible to achieve, then you have despair. 
This is not saying that the good's no longer good, but since it's difficult to achieve, you have a movement away from it, and so far as it's difficult. On the other hand, as we said before, sometimes the inclination with respect to the arduous good or evil, as currently absent, is not towards the good, but away from the evil. In this case, we have two other passions, fear and daring. Fear is an inclination away from the arduously avoided evil, insofar as it is difficult to avoid. So, insofar as your passions are focused on the fact that the impending evil is difficult to avoid, that gives you the passion or emotion of fear. On the other hand, if your passions are focused on the fact that it's useful to remove that impending evil, then you have the emotion of daring, which is an inclination to remove that future arduously avoided evil. So daring is somewhat similar to anger, except for anger is focused on a present evil, whereas daring is focused on a future evil. Now, these are the 11 passions. You'll want to memorize them and their objects. We have love, hate, desire, aversion, joy, sadness, hope, despair, daring, fear, and anger. Knowing these, again, is crucial for understanding and analyzing moral action. Now, there are two things to note about all 11 of these. Sometimes acts of will have the same name as these passions. For instance, love is not only a sensible passion, which is in the body, but it's also something in the intellectual soul. So, it's important to distinguish between the passion of love, or the passion of hate, and the act of will, which is called love, and the act of will, which is called hate. Likewise, we can say that hope is something that happens in the intellectual soul, not just in the body. So there's a sort of intellectual hope, a hope that is an act of will, and then there's a bodily hope, which is common between humans and animals. So with a lot of these, the name will also be used to describe acts of will, but it's important not to confuse an act of will called hope or love with the bodily emotion or passion, which is called love or hope or hate. The second thing to note is that passions as such are morally neutral. So just because you have the emotion of love does not necessarily entail any sort of moral claim, good or bad. Likewise, the emotion of hate, which is a simple inclination away from what's evil without qualification, that doesn't necessarily mean anything morally good or bad. Now, because the will and reason generally has some sort of control over the passions, the passions can be good or bad, as we'll see later. But for now, it's uh, sufficient to say that the passions in themselves are not morally good or evil. They arise without your choice. Nevertheless, they can be good or evil insofar as they are under the control of reason and will. So, now that we've talked about the sense appetites, which are also called sensuality, as well as the inclinations that result from the sense appetites, which are called passions, we can move on to discussing the locomotive power. Now, the locomotive power is a lot more straightforward than the sense appetites. Passions do not directly bring about movements in the body. Rather, they do so by means of the locomotive power. For instance, being angry with someone doesn't necessarily result in the bodily action of murdering them. Sexual desire doesn't necessarily result in a bodily movement toward sexual intercourse. Bodily movements come from the passions by way of the locomotive power. This is the power which proximately controls the limbs of the body. For instance, it moves the legs, hands, neck, and face. Bodily injuries, inebriation, sleep, and the will can all impede the locomotive power. If so, one may have a passion towards some external action, but never do that external action. For instance, during sleep, you may have a movement of the sense appetites towards doing your homework, but when you wake up, you discover you haven't actually done your homework. 
The reason for this is that chemicals are released during sleep which impede the operation of your locomotive power. Since your locomotive power is impeded, you don't actually perform the action that you want to perform during sleep. So it's not the case that your repetitive appetites aren't active during sleep. They are, as you can tell during dreams, when you feel fear, love, or anger. Nevertheless, they don't have any external effect in your body precisely because your locomotive power is impeded by the chemicals released during sleep. You could see less extreme forms of this during inebriation or when you're simply tired. For instance, if you've been working physically all day, you might want to do some other physical activity but just not be capable of doing it. To summarize what we've covered, in the last video we looked at the vegetative powers and the sense powers, which were the external senses and the internal senses, and in this video we've looked at the locomotive power and the sense appetite. What we have not covered is the rational appetite, which is called the will, and the intellect. These will need to be saved for later. Thank you.